and we're live all right guys welcome to the fourth watch party the third one we've actually live streamed um let's just get my camera going here all right so yubi's joining in a sec um i just need to make sure everyone can hear me so can uh someone in the chat and let me know we're live. and we're right, guys. live Welcome, right, guys. To the welcome to fourth the watch party. Fourth the third watch one we've party. Such a new one we've actually live streamed. Um, let's just get um, my camera. Let's just okay. get my camera going. Sorry here. about that. All right. Let me just let the loop finish. All right. We're good. No, we're not good. All right. We're good. Sorry about that. All right. Still getting over the technical stuff here. So um, let's see. Uh, oh man, I've got so many things going. Okay, finally. Okay, so chat, everyone can hear. It's good, awesome. Thank you for informing me. All right, we're getting going here. So as this works, if this is your first time here, we do the live stream of the Verveki, uh, the whole series. We're going to do it. I think he's at like 30 or 40 episodes out now, planning even more. Um, we're only on episode four now. And what we do is play through it. We do a short intermission at the end, and then we will do a video uh, discussion. Like people will jump in on a Zoom call and we'll discuss the episode. Um, I will give a link for you guys partway through or like near the end of the episode where you can join the video discussion if you want. The only thing I ask is that you, you know, try and participate. Don't just join to watch uh, because it will be streamed on this YouTube video. So everyone will get a chance to watch it. Um, only people who really want to participate and say something um, should really join. Um, I believe we're probably going to do like a first priority, like two minutes or something for anyone who's supporting us on Patreon to come in because we're going to have limited spots. Um, we usually do. Um, and if that doesn't fill up, then it's just kind of open and anyone can join. There will be a waiting room and I'll just have to kind of accept you and, and uh, you know, let you in to the discussion um, manually. Anything else? I think we're good to go. Pretty sure we're good to go. All right, we're on episode four. Let's get it going. Welcome again to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. This is episode four. So last time we discussed the Axial Revolution and in particular uh, how it moved into ancient Israel. We talked about the advent of the psychotechnology of time as cosmic history, as a narrative in which there is an open future and in which your actions, the moral quality of your actions can d determine that future in which you participate along with God in the creation of that future. This brings with it the idea of progress, moral progress, the increase in justice, and this is how we move from uh, the less real world to the more real world. For the ancient Israelites it's understood as a, a journey through time and space historically. We talked about the kind of God that the God of uh, the Bible is, uh, how he is, in fact, the God of this open future. And particularly, he intervenes at moments of, moments of kairos, turning points, uh, where he tries to bring people back on course. We talked about the sense of faith as the sense of well, being on course, f to being able to sense how history is flowing and unfolding, how you are participating in that story, how you are shaping it and being shaped by it in a tightly reciprocal manner and that sin is the deviation from that and what is needed is to wake us back up to bring us back on course and we talked about how uh, the prophets represented that and they represent increasingly um, that vision that axial vision of the moral redemption of history we then turned to look at how the Axial Revolution was coming into ancient Greece, and in particular two figures, 
we look at, we're looking at the figures of Pythagoras and Socrates. Last time we talked about Pythagoras and how he represents an acceptation of that shamanic behavior of altering your state of consciousness, entering into something like fl uh, soul flight, but how for Pythagoras that had been allied with the psychotechnology that was being emphasized in Greece, rational argumentation, the discovery of rational patterns in the world. And Pythagoras, of course, is famous for discovering that uh, music can be expressed mathematically. He is at least associated his school with things like the Pythagorean theorem. This uh, idea that we can enhance our capacity uh, to pick up on the real patterns in the world, even if those are not uh, uh, readily apparent to us. And by coming into a direct awareness of those patterns through our rational insight and faculties, uh, we can transform ourselves. And Pythagoras changes the shamanic soul flight into a release, a freedom from imprisonment in this world, which he represented as being imprisoned in the body, and we fly free. And so soul flight has been turned into a radical kind of self-transcendence in which we are liberating ourselves from the illusory world as we more and more conform to the rational patterns that dictate the structure of reality. The other person who is going to figure, and in fact is figures even more largely in the Axial Revolution uh, in ancient Greece, is the figure of Socrates. Socrates and Pythagoras are going to be the two most important influences on Plato. And if you were to put Western civilization onto two feet, uh, the one foot is the Bible, the other foot uh, is the works of Plato. <clears throat> so Socrates is a very unusual figure. Um, there are as many interpretations of Socrates as, uh, as there are of people like Jesus. Uh, even in his time, there were many different Socratic movements, groups of people who claimed to be adherents and disciples of Socrates. He is an enigmatic, interesting, provocative, and maddeningly frustrating figure to try and get clear on. So I want it understood that when I'm talking about Socrates, I'm talking about a particular interpretation uh, that I share with other people. I think it can be well argued for. Uh, but uh, as I said, whether or not this was the full historical Socrates, uh, it's very hard to know. And in some sense, this isn't that relevant because it's the Socrates I'm going to talk about that has become part of the cognitive and existential grammar of the West. So getting into the figure of Socrates is kind of interesting. A good way to start is uh, to see how, how provocative a person he was is to uh, do his biography. So as many of you probably know, uh, ancient Greece uh, was a, a world in which people believed they could speak to the god through oracles. The oracles were human. Or, um, or otherwise natural phenomena that represent how the gods were speaking to humanity. One of the most important oracles is at Delphi. And I've been to Delphi. If you get a chance at some point in your life, go to Delphi. Uh, it will really put the zap on your brain because the way the landscape is organized uh, really does have a transformative impact on sort of your consciousness and your sense of self and your sense of place in the world. So the situation, the, the, the right, uh, uh, the site of Delphi is itself very transformative. What would happen is a woman, Pythia, would sit uh, in a cave or, or something similar to it. Again, the cave, always the caves, like the association with shamanism. Remember that shamanism is associated with cave art, t ritual practices taking place in caves like in Pythagoras. So she's in a cave. Uh, she's sitting on a tripod. She, there might be some intoxicating gases in there. She's eating perhaps eucalyptus leaves. Um, she's probably going into some kind of psychedelic trance state. Uh, that seems plausible. And then what happens is people would, because that's, that's, that is a cross-cultural thing, we find that people are thought to have access to the gods by being able to enter into altered states of consciousness. So what would happen is people would come in, they would bring their questions, they would pose questions to Pythia. She would then uh, speak uh, on behalf of the gods, and then after speaking on behalf of the gods, uh, the people around her, would, there would be males who would interpret what she had to say. So, 
The thing about being an oracle is, if you want to stay in business, you don't want to give clear answers. Right? So if I come to an oracle and I ask a specific question, I, I don't want to give a specific answer. I think there's a very good reason for that. I don't think that people actually can foresee the future in any kind of supernatural manner. So typically, if you go to an oracle and say, should I marry Cassandra, you'll get an answer something like, sometimes the spring comes early. Or should I invest in this project, you'll get an answer like, you know, sometimes the squirrels do not gather too many nuts. You don't know what to make of this, and it might provoke an insight in you, it might provoke a reflection in you. Um, and whether or not the events go one way or the other, you can often retrospectively reinterpret them as having been consonant with the Delphic Oracle. And so the Oracle seems to be providing a foresightful information, but usually, of course, it's not. So what happens is a bunch of Socrates' friends, he's already famous when we sort of meet him in his biography, a bunch of Socrates' friends decide to go to the Oracle and ask the oracle a question about Socrates. So they make the trick to Delphi. And I, 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 in my mind, I sort of picture this almost like half-jokingly. They want to see what kind of crazy answer they're going to get uh, from the oracle about Socrates. So they go all the way up to uh, the oracle, and then they pose their question. And the question they pose is, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? And what they're looking for, or perhaps not what they're looking for, what they're expecting is some very cryptic, obscure answer. Like, you know, the snow melts farther in the south or some bizarre answer. And instead they get this answer, no. There's no human being wiser than Socrates. Crystal clear answer. And so you can imagine how shocked they are. So they travel back, of course, to relate this story to Socrates. And here's, here's something telling. First of all, that's just telling in and of itself that the Delphic Oracle would give such a clear answer. Now, it's, 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 it's a qualified answer. There's no human being wiser than Socrates, right? But when they go back to Socrates, Socrates' response is also profound, interesting. So if we're honest, if we're honest and we found out from some sacred authority that we are very wise, most of us would be very self-congratulatory. It's like, yeah. I knew it. And how do I know that? Because one of the most persistent biases have is that people believe they're above average intelligence. And of course, most people must be wrong about that because most people have, well, average intelligence. But if you ask anybody, is your intelligence average? They will tell you, no, I have above average intelligence. More so, of course, even for ideas such as wisdom. But Socrates isn't self-congratulatory. He doesn't say, yep, I knew it all along, there's the confirmation I so want. Now that's really telling in of itself, because to quote a friend of mine, Leo Ferraro, we are entering the age of confirmation porn, in which people are continuously seeking confirmation from their beliefs, and, and part of what's going on to the meaning crisis and the ever expansion of bullshit in our society is precisely because we have technologically enhanced through social media our capacity for gratifying our bias for confirmation. We'll talk about this later, but we all carry a terrific bias called the confirmation bias in which we seek information that confirms our beliefs and we tend to avoid information that challenges it. And part of what is going wrong right now in our culture is that through a lot of factors that are endemic to the meaning crisis, we are accelerating and exacerbating our propensity for falling into the confirmation bias. And I think that's what my friend Leo means by confirmation porn. We have a kind of pornography. If we take pornography to mean the gratuitous and unmorally justified uh, satisfaction of a desire, then we are living in an age of confirmation porn. 
Socrates is a corrective to that. Here is a great temptation. He has presented the word of the gods that he is wise, wiser than anyone else, and rather than accepting it and giving in to that confirmation bias, his immediate response is to challenge it. Now, the challenge is tricky for Socrates. Socrates is no atheist, although he's going to be charged with atheism when he's put on trial. But he does believe in the gods. He's going to do something very important about the gods. He's going to transform the Greek gods into moral exemplars. But and what that means for Socrates is the gods can't lie. The gods can't lie. For Socrates, and this is one of the ways he's going to transform the understanding of the gods and Plato along with him, the Greek gods, as they are represented in standard Greek myths, aren't very accurate portrayals because those gods lie and they Right, they cheat and they betray. Zeus cheats. Zeus cheats on his uh, his wife, etc. But for Socrates, and this is part of the Axial Revolution, the gods represent moral exemplars. They represent ways in which we can self-transcend and morally improve. So for Socrates, it's therefore axiomatic that the gods can't lie to him. So the gods are telling the truth. This wedding. And this is something we're going to come back to. The way the Greeks wed divinity, divinity I should say, to reality, that truth and sacredness are bound up together, is, is going to be really pivotal. Think about how much we separate those two in our culture. But for Socrates, they are interpenetrating. So the gods can't lie. They have to be disclosers of the truth. But on, this, on the other hand, Socrates, has significant and profound self-knowledge. One of the things I have tattooed on my back is know thyself. It was inscribed at the Delphic Oracle, but Socrates makes it his personal slogan for life. There's been some recent things written about this, and I think they've largely reflect, uh, reflected a misunderstanding of what know thyself means. Know thyself doesn't mean become aware of your biography. I mean, we all are prey to that, and we have a culture that exacerbates that narcissism. We like to stroke the ego of our personal autobiography and store up treasured moments that we can point to other people that indicate our uniqueness and our specialness and why the universe should specially take care of and pay attention to us. That's not what know thyself means. It doesn't mean that kind of stroking of your autobiographical ego. Know thyself is much more a kind of direct participatory knowing. It means understanding how you operate. It's not, it's, if I were to use a, a literary analogy, it's not like your autobiography. It's more like your owner's manual. It's how do you operate? What are the principles? What are the powers, perils? What are the constraints that are operating within you? Socrates, as we'll see, thought that that kind of self-knowledge was central. And the, this is the core of the Axial Revolution. The Axial Revolution is this critical awareness and sense of responsibility of one's own cognition. So, on one hand, the gods can't lie when they say Socrates is the wisest human being. But on the other hand, Socrates has deep self-knowledge. He has Socratic self-knowledge in which he is convinced that he is not wise. And he is not willing to give up on either one of those. And that's a telling thing about him. That tells you something very central about him. He holds these two together. His existential self-knowledge and this disclosure from reality are going, neither one of them is going to be given a greater authority. They're going to be held together. So now Socrates faces a personal dilemma, a dilemma that goes to the core of who and what he is. How can it be that he is the wisest human being when he knows that he is not wise? So this is a very deep dilemma that he sets for himself. It's a kind of profound problem that he seeks to solve. And what that means is that Socrates starts on a quest. He starts on a quest of trying to determine how both of those things could be the case at the same time. Now the quest 
seems to have evolved very naturally into a way in which he interacted with those around him. What Socrates would do is he would go to people who claimed or would credited with being wise and he would ask them questions. He invented, in fact, what has become known as the Socratic method, also known as Elenchus. The Socratic method is a way of asking questions in order to try and draw somebody out. We'll talk a little bit more about Elenchus in a minute, but first I want to talk about the two types of people that we have good reason to believe Socrates was interacting and what that can tell us about the Socratic notion of wisdom. And we're going to see how this Socratic notion of wisdom knowledge and this idea of self-knowledge is deeply bound up with how meaningful your life is. So, the two groups that Socrates, the two groups of people that were accredited as being wise were the philosophers and the sophists. Now, if you remember last time we talked about Pythagoras, Pythagoras actually invents the word philosophy. Uh, it comes from two Greek words, philia, sophia. This means right, the, the, the friendship love of wisdom. So, and Pythagoras creates a community around him. You create a community, distributed cognition, in which you interact with other people in order to try and pursue wisdom. A philosopher is someone who, in concert with others, is a lover of wisdom. So Socrates is interacting with the philosophers, and in, in particular, one group of philosophers that come before him. In fact, Socrates is regarded as creating a revolution in philosophy precisely from how he differed from the natural philosophers. And he's also doing the Socratic method with the sophists. And you can see that this also comes from Sophia, wisdom. It's where we get our word sophisticated from. The sophists are also people who claim to be wise. Now, the natural philosophers are very interesting. The natural philosophers seem to represent a fundamental change in human cognition. So I'm going to take as an example one of the natural philosophers who is considered to be the first example of it, Thales. Now, because these guys are just av as we're coming out of the Dark Age, and they predate Socrates, sometimes by a hundred, couple hundred years, right, or thereabouts, a lot of what we have from them is very fragmentary. We don't have very much. Um, in fact, you can put most of Thales' philosophy into three lines. Uh, into three sentences. I once taught this to a course of mine, and one of my students went out and made a t-shirt in which they put all of Thales' philosophy on one t-shirt, because we, that's how fragmentary it is. Let's talk about these three fragments, because they reveal something very important. One is, all is the moist. The next is, the lodestone has suke, and this is important because this word suke, which we now pronounce psyche, is going to be the basis of the idea of psychology as a discipline. And finally, everything is filled with gods, which sounds very preaxial, almost shamanic. Now, what you have to pay attention to here is not what Thales is saying, but what the, what he says reveals about the kind of thinking he is creating. What does he mean by this? All is the moist. Of course, there's controversy about all of this because it's fragmentary, it's old, but given how other people in the ancient world, like Aristotle, followed up on this, a plausible interpretation is everything is made out of water. Everything is made out of water. Now, that's false. Everything isn't made out of water. It's not just scientifically false, it's kind of metaphysically false. Everything can't be made out of water or we wouldn't be able to identify water on its own. But put that aside. Think about this. What surrounds ancient Greece? Water. If you dig into the ground, what will you hit? Water. What falls from the sky? Water. What does everything need in order to live? 
Water. What can take the shape of any container you put it in? Water. See, what I'm trying to get you to see is, although Thales' idea is false, it's highly rational. It's highly plausible. What he's doing is using his reason and his observation to come up with a plausible explanation of what the underlying substance is behind everything. By the way, pay attention to this word. This means stands under, another metaphor. Right? It's related to lots of other words where we use standing to talk about understanding, for example. Okay. So notice what he's doing here. He's not doing mythology. He's not generating a narrative about some divine agent. He's not saying, this has happened because Zeus cheated on Hera, and then Hera sought. There, there is no story here. There's no mythological narrative. There's no right, divine agents involved. That's not how he's trying to explain or understand. Instead, he's doing a rational analysis based on observation. And he's trying to get at the underlying stuff that everything is made out of. Do you see what I'm showing you? What Thales is inventing, is there any other word for this? He's inventing how to think scientifically. How, how this happens is obscure. But that's what's happening. He's inventing the kind of thinking that we now, and I'm going to say it again, take it for granted as if it's natural. But he's inventing it. What does this mean? The lodestone has suke. So a lodestone is a natural form of magnet. What's interesting about magnets is that they can move themselves and they can move other things around them. The original meaning of this is, of course, breath or wind, but what it ultimately refers to and came to refer to is right, anything that's a living in the sense that it's self-moving, that it can move itself and that it can therefore cause other things to move. So I can move myself and therefore I can make other things move. The magnet can move itself, and it can make other things move. I'm aware of suke within me. I see the magnet doing something similar, and therefore I conclude the magnet and I both share suke. He's wrong, but that doesn't matter. This is a plausible, rational argument. Here he's trying to get at what we would now call the underlying force behind things. Now, please remember that, by the way, that suke originally means your capacity for being able to move yourself and make other things move. And you may ask, well, why does that become the word for mind, psychology, mind, suke? Because the mind is that part of you which you can most move. It is the most self-moving part of you, and it's where all of your capacity to move other things starts. If I'm going to move this marker, my mind first moves itself, and that drives me to move the marker. But that way of even thinking about me so that I can start a science of the psyche starts with Thales. Now, what, what's this? Everything is filled with... This seems so scientific, John, and then you're throwing this at me. The gods. Isn't that a throwback to mythology? I don't think so. I don't think so. See, look what he's doing here. Now, I, inter I need to introduce a term. I promise to try and keep the technicalities to a minimum, but we need a term here, right? So ontology is the study of being, the structure of reality. Ontological analysis It's when you use ra reasoning to try and get at the underlying structure of reality by getting at the underlying stuff and the underlying forces that are at work in it. So Thales is introducing the ontological analysis that drives the scientific revolution. What are scientists doing? They're trying to get at the underlying stuff. They're still trying to do it right now. They're trying to get at the underlying forces. They're trying to see into the depths of reality. They're engaging in ontological depth perception. 
This doesn't mean, right, physical, like this doesn't mean our normal perception into spatial depth. What I'm seeing, what I mean here is seeing with the mind into the depths of reality, ontological depth perception. Now once you get that he's discovering this way, he's discovering, he's inventing this way of looking at the world that's going to bleed into right here, right now, Think about how powerful that way must be. Think of the power in that vision. He gets an access to the depths of reality. And what is he saying? That provokes awe. That provokes wonder. That gives him a sense of connecting to what is most real. It helps him to make the most sense of things. And that's what it is to experience something as sacred. So this is powerful stuff. Now Socrates was, seems to have been influenced by a particular one of these natural philosophers called Anaxagoras, who was in Athens just before Socrates. Uh, Anaxagoras um, declared that the sun wasn't a god, for example, that it was a hot rock and he got into a lot of trouble for things like this. And Socrates seems to have enjoyed, more than enjoyed, he seems to have been impressed by the natural philosopher's commitment to getting at the truth. But ultimately, Socrates, he rejects this, not because he rejects reason, rational analysis, he's going to engage in that himself multiple times, or argumentation. His whole Socratic method, as we'll see, is all about argumentation. What does he reject about the natural philosophers? They don't help him with his axial project. See, the problem with the natural philosophers is they give you truth without transformation. They give you facts, they give you knowledge, but they do not indicate how you become wise. They do not indicate how you overcome self-deception. They do not indicate, as Socrates would say, how to become a good person. Now it's interesting how much people say that even now, even today, sometimes in clear ways that are helpful, sometimes in confused and mixed up ways which are unhelpful. But the idea that our scientific worldview, while giving us all kinds of knowledge, does not in any way train us for wisdom, does not tell us how to become wise, does not tell us how to transcend ourselves and become better people. This is a common complaint, and we'll come back to it, about the scientific worldview. Socrates sees it even then. So here you have truth, but no relevance. The truths that are discovered are not existentially relevant. They don't matter, they don't enable the cultivation of wisdom, the transformation and transcendence of the self. Now, Socrates is interacting with the sophist, which is famous, is a lot more antagonistic. This, this when he talks about his relation here, it's much more the language or the tone, at least that's how I read it, of disappointment. He was expecting more and he found less. Here, and it's not clear how much this is Socrates and how much this is Plato who's writing about Socrates, but here the relationship is much more antagonistic. Now who are the sophists? Well, if you remember, we talked about when the Axial Revolution is coming to Greece, you're getting the emergence of democracy. And in, uh, in Athens, the democracy is direct democracy. Now, before we get uh, too far into this, we don't want to over-glamorize this. Yes, Athens is uh, the beginning of democracy, but let's remember, if, if I was a woman, the last place I would want to dwell in the ancient world is ancient Athens. Ancient Athens treats its women horribly, just horribly. Sparta treats its women better than Athens. Democracy is only for Athenian adult males, women, foreigners, anybody else, even if they're Greek, they're not 
right, considered to be worthy of participation in the democratic process. And it's a direct democracy, right? Everybody files into the assembly and votes on everything. Now, what that means is, as I've already mentioned, your capacity for debate and argumentation is a route to power. This is why it develops so powerfully in ancient Athens. The better you are at arguing, the better you are at persuading other people, the more powerful and influential you will be. What happens is a group of people invent a new psychotechnology. They invent rhetoric. They invent ways of picking up on how language and cognition interact. They find standardized skills that can be practiced and developed so that you can influence people. Increase the chance that your language will change their mind. Now, the sophists were only con concerned with teaching the skills. They basically separated the technology from any kind of moral commitment. So, for example, a particular sophist might go in the morning to this aristocrat and help him argue for why Athens should increase the number of ships in its navy, and in the afternoon go to this aristocrat and help him craft an argument as to why Athens should decrease the number of ships in the navy. To the sophist didn't care, which was the case. What mattered was empowering the individual to win the argument. Now, how does this work, and how can we relate it to our, uh, to our lives now? So, Basically, a good way to think about this is the sophists pick up on the fact that when we are communicating, we're going to talk about this a lot later as we go on, we are being driven by what we find salient and relevant, not just what we find true or believe to be the case. You remember with the nine dot problem, what stands out to us, what's relevant, shapes how we see things and how we understand them. So, let me give you a modern analog for what, how rhetoric works, a place where rhetoric is readily apparent. Advertising. Okay. See, the point about advertisement is to make use of the way your brain will associate things, the way your brain finds certain things salient, make things seem highly relevant to you in order to manipulate your behavior. Now, what's telling about this and this is the point about the sophist, is how much that can happen right, in a way that is disconnected from whether or not it's true. I mean, you watch the beer commercial, and here it is, here's really attractive people, and they all get together, and they're all having a great time, and it's this beer, and here's the beautiful, attractive people. Go into an actual bar. That's not like that. Okay, and you're not, you're not going to see but, uh, the kind of broken down lives, drunk people. Now, here's the thing. You know that that's not true. You know that, you, like, if you, like, if you went into a bar and you actually saw something like that happening, if when you washed your hair with shampoo, you were suddenly in the shampoo commercial, you'd worry about your sanity. You know it's not true. It doesn't matter. It makes certain stimuli salient to you, and so you buy the beer. You buy the shampoo. This is what I mean when I say your beliefs aren't the only thing driving you. So this brings us to a notion I promised to come back to, and I want to use it technically. I'm not trying to be vulgar, but this is important. This is the notion of bullshit. And the classic work is by Harry Frankfurt on this, his essay on bullshit. It's 20 years old now. Because Frankfurt is very interested in talking about the difference between somebody being a bullshit artist and somebody being a liar. Because they aren't the same. They can overlap. A person can be both a liar and a bullshit artist. But let's talk about pure cases. How does the liar work? The liar depends on your commitment to the truth. The liar tells you something, 
I'll use P to represent some proposition. The liar says P to you, even though not P is the case, because if he can get convince you that P is the case, you will change your behavior because your behavior is, to some degree, significant degree, influenced by your commitment to the truth. If you believe P is true, that will change your behavior. That's how lying works. Lying depends on the fact that, in general, people are committed to the truth because, in general, people want to be in touch with reality. That's not how bullshit works. See, bullshit, unlike lying, works by making you dis disinterested, unconcerned with whether or not what, with what is being said is true. When somebody's bullshitting you, they're trying to get you to not find important or right, central how true the claim is. Instead, they're working in terms of the rhetoric. They're trying to capture you in terms of how catchy it is, like the advertiser, how salient it is, how much it grabs your attention. So uh, there was a famous example from this, from The Simpsons. And you know, The Simpsons has been on for a thousand years now, and I think it's still on. So this is from a long time ago. And at the time, it seemed so uh, almost absurdly ridiculous funny, but it, it's turned out to be extremely, extremely prescient. Because the example is a political example. There are two aliens running for political office. And they're giving a speech to Americans. Right? And I mean no insult to Americans, but I mean, I think we're aware of how what I'm going to say is relevant to American politics right now. And the speech goes something like this. One of the aliens named Kang says, my fellow Americans, when I was young, I dreamt of being a baseball. But now we must move forward, not backwards, upwards, twirling, twirling towards freedom. And everybody cheers. Now it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. But he invokes youth, baseball, moving forward, moving upward, twirling, and freedom. And so if you're an American, you get this rush. You get this rush. That rush is, these are all salient things. They're highly relevant to you. You associate and identify with them. And so you're swept up. You're caught up in it. Now, why does bullshit matter? Well, part, as I said at the beginning, part of the way people articulate the meaning crisis is there's so much bullshit and it seems to be increasing. We are separating relevance and salience from truth. But there's a deeper reason, and I think this is part of why it matters to Socrates. Look, you can't, although we use this metaphor for self-deception, it's actually not a good metaphor. You can't lie to yourself. It makes no sense. Cognitive psychologists have been pointing, and philosophers have been pointing this out. You can't know, not P, and then say to yourself, but P, but P. The trouble is, you know that this is not the case, and so simply stating this to yourself doesn't do anything. You can't lie to yourself because you're in possession of the truth. Did I just prove to you that self-deception is impossible? No, not at all. See, you can't lie to yourself, but here's what I would argue. You can bullshit yourself. Why? Because lying has to do with believing. I'm going to come back to this again and again. Look, believing isn't something you directly do. Here, I'll show you. Pick a belief you would like to have. I would like to have the belief that everybody loves me. I don't believe that, but I would like to truly have that belief. So what should I do? I should just believe, believe. You see televangelists doing this, telling people, believe. But you can't. You can hope that everybody loves you. You can wish that everybody loves you. But if I say, believe it, you can't do it. That's not how belief works. It's not a voluntary action. You can't lie to yourself. See, self-deception works in a different way. You know what you can do? You can bullshit yourself. How can you bullshit yourself? Because what you can do is direct your attention. If I say, pay attention to this finger, you can. And you can also choose to pay attention to something. Now attention, and we'll talk about this later, and it's how central it is, there's two sides to attention. 
You can direct your attention, for example, if I say, your left big toe, you're paying attention to it, and suddenly it's salient to you. When you pay attention to something, it makes it more salient. It stands out for you. But you know what else? Attention can also be direct, not only be directed by you to make things more salient, your attention can be caught. A sudden noise. And you turn. And you attend to it. It was salient and it captures your attention. So not only can you direct your attention, your attention can be captured by what you find salient. And notice what this means you can do. You can direct your attention to something and make it more salient. And because it's more salient, it will tend to capture your attention. And because you're paying attention to it, you make it more salient, which means it will more likely capture your attention. Do you see what's happening here? These two things feed on each other. I pay more attention to it, it becomes more salient. It becomes more salient, it gathers my attention. I pay more attention to it, I'm more likely to be attracted to it. And it spins on itself in a self-organizing manner until your attention is attached to something. It's super salient to you. It's highly relevant to you. And you lose the capacity to notice other things. That's how you bullshit yourself. The salience and the catchiness of the stimulus has overtaken any concern you have for whether or not it's true or represents reality. This is how you deceive yourself. So do you see, that's why Socrates is going to be so antagonistic towards the sophists. They are the opposite, the opposite of the axial revolution. They are the opposite of that rational self-knowledge, the attempt to overcome self-deception. The sophists are promoting bullshit. And when you promote bullshit, you not only promote the deception of others, you make yourself more vulnerable to self-deception. You fall more and more prey to self-deception. So, the natural philosophers are truth without relevance. The sophists and their propensity for the pro promotion of bullshit represent relevance disconnected from truth. So notice here, they have the power to transform people, but they've disconnected it from the pursuit of the truth. These people can give us knowledge of the facts, but do not facilitate self-transformation. What Socrates wanted is he wanted both. He wanted individuals who knew how to pay attention in such a way that what they found salient helped them determine the truth, and that the truth that they found helped them to train their attention to find salience. Socrates wanted Something like that. So what he would do is he would go about questioning people, maddening frustration. So Socrates would come up to somebody and say, well, what are you doing here? And, oh, I'm in the marketplace. Well, why are you in the marketplace? Well, I'm purchasing something. Well, why are you purchasing something? Well, I want to get these goods. Well, why do you want these goods? Because they'll make me happy. And then then Socrates starts to, oh, so you must know what happiness is. Well, happiness is pleasure, Socrates, I guess, and these things give me pleasure. But is it possible, Socrates would ask, to have pleasure and still find yourself in a horrible situation that you really dislike? Well, of course, Socrates, that's possible. Oh, so then happiness isn't pleasure. You're being coy with me. Tell me, tell me, Socrates would say. What is happiness? Oh, uh, it's, you know, it's getting what's most important to you. Well, that means that you have to have knowledge. Is it any kind of knowledge? Well, no, it's the knowledge of what it, what's important. What's truly important or what you only think is important? I guess what's truly important, Socrates. Okay, so what's that knowledge of what's truly important called? I guess that would be wisdom, Socrates. Oh, so in order to be happiness, to find happiness, you must have first cultivated wisdom. Tell me how you cultivate wisdom and what wisdom is. And the person goes, ah, they collapse. 
They get to this point where they can't answer. They fall into a state called aporia. P people compared it to being stung by a stingray or falling under a magician's spell. You don't know what's going on. Now here's what, now, one, one, one thing you might say is, well, Socrates is just a skeptic. He's trying to show people that they don't know anything because he wants to show that the gods are right, that nobody has any wisdom, etc. That's too simple. I think something more sophisticated is going on with Socrates, Socrates, right? Socrates is trying to get you to realize, he's like, he's like incarnating the axial revolution. He's trying to get you to realize how much, how much each one of us, myself included, how much we're bullshitting ourselves all the time. Why? Because we pursue things. We find things salient to us. Their happiness, fame, it's salient to us, and we're pursuing it. We're putting our efforts into it way before we understand it, way before we grasp the truths of it. We are always making ourselves susceptible to bullshit because we are being driven by powerful motivations that are salient to us that are greatly in excess of our understanding of their truth or reality. We are always, all of us, bullshitting ourselves. And the point about, and what that does is that provokes a reaction in people. It goes one of two ways. People either go, ah, and they don't want to be showing that about themselves, and they become angry at Socrates. Or, some people have an insight. They realize, oh, oh, I need to transform myself. I need to find a way to keep relevance and truth tracking each other enabling each other. And when Socrates realized that he was having this effect on people, he had his answer to his dilemma. He knew how it was that the gods were not lying and he was the wisest of human beings. His answer was the following. He knew what he did not know. And we all say, I know what I don't know. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. No, 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 no. He knew in a way that allows you to directly, painfully confront your capacity for bullshitting yourself. To really realize what you do not know is to realize, I am pursuing her, and I don't know what's going on. I'm pursuing that, and I don't know what's going on. That's what he's talking about. Now, many people think that Socrates just concluded that that's it. He didn't know anything. No, that's not what Socrates is talking about. Socrates does claim to know things. You can imagine how Socrates pisses people off. So he's put on trial. In ancient Athens, there isn't a state that arrests you. One, one citizen accuses another. You're brought on trial. You're put in front of 500 men. It's always men, remember? Very, very, very chauvinistic society. And then the accuser presents their case, the defendant presents their case, and then they, the jury votes on it. So Socrates was accused by people that he pissed off of, uh, of atheism, which doesn't mean not believing in gods, it just means teaching strange gods. Because as I mentioned, he was concerned to make the gods moral exemplars. Now when Socrates is on trial, it becomes clear that they will let him go if he sort of agrees to stop doing this philosophy stuff that he's doing, stops pissing people off. And then he utters something that's very famous. And this is a statement of him deeply knowing something. He says, the unexamined life is not worth living. A life in which there is no effort made to put these two together is a life that is not worth living because it is a life, to use our terms, that is a wash and bullshit that is beset by self-deception and self-destructive behavior. So Socrates knows what makes a life meaningful. There's a kind of wisdom. Wisdom is to keep your truth machinery and your relevance machinery tightly coupled together so that you don't bullshit yourselves. See, Socrates famously claimed to know ta erotica. We're going to have to talk about this later because 
It comes from erotic, and for most of us, all you hear when you hear erotic is sexual. That's not what eros means, right? It's a more, much more broader term in ancient Greece. What Socrates means is he knows how to love well. And it, that, that doesn't mean romantic love. What it means is Socrates knows what to care about. He knows how to keep what he cares about with what's real. He would do things like walk into the marketplace and say, look at all the things I don't need. He'd say, how much time did you spend on uh, fixing your hair this morning? Oh, about 20 minutes. How much on fixing yourself? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Socrates knew what to find significant, what to find important. He knew how to properly care. He also compared himself to a midwife. He knew how to take that caring and that sense of what makes life meaningful, the cultivation of wisdom, and help people draw out, give birth to their better self. That's why he compared himself to a midwife. This is what he knew. Socrates knew how reason and love go together. You might find it sort of entertaining to know that Frankfurt, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, wrote a book called Reasons for Love, where he also puts together reason and love, things that we have been taught to keep as antithetical to each other. For Socrates, separating them, which our culture regularly and reliably does, is one of our greatest follies. They need to be interdependent and intertwined with each other. We need to rationally know what we should most care about. So Socrates is put on trial. He's found guilty. He just narrowly loses. So then after losing, and it looks like part of the reasons were political and part of them he's pissed off the powerful and all kinds of things. And he associated with people that turned out to be corrupt. But he, he loses by a very narrow margin. And then what happens is each side proposes a penalty. The accusers propose death, that Socrates should be killed. And then this tells you something about Socrates. Socrates says the following, practicing philosophy has cost me. I have to constantly work at it. It's very demanding. I'm not right, wealthy. I'm dependent on other people. Uh, people attack me. It's been very risky. The worst penalty could be for me to continue doing philosophy. And in order to make that even worse, the government should give me free housing and free food for the rest of my life. So as you can imagine, <laughs> this pisses everybody off. And Socrates is found uh, in a much greater vote, he's condemned to death. Now notice Socrates is so convinced that he has the right kind of know thyself, not autobiographical, but this that I've been talking about. He knows how he works and how to train it to transform it so that he cares well and reduces his capacity for self-deception, that he's willing to die for it. He finds that meaning so important that he's willing to die for it. Now, he's a very interesting figure for that reason. But there's also other important things we should know about Socrates. This, the shamanic is still in Socrates because he could do the following. He could stand in one place for 24 or even 48 hours meditating on his own thoughts. He was terrifically capable of controlling his body's physiological reactions. He could drink a lot without getting drunk. He could go into battle in winter without any right, shoes on his feet. He was famously brave. So, he, And he had this divine voice. Whenever he was about to do something wrong, he'd hear this voice that would tell him, don't do it, Socrates. So once again, you still find, right, the shamanic has been carried into the Socratic in really important ways. We're going to talk about later how those two are interwoven together. Now, Socrates has many followers, but there's one person who was present at the trial but wasn't present at his death when he drinks the hemlock, 
And you know what? I got to sit in the spot in, in, in Athens that corresponds to where Socrates was probably imprisoned. At least that's what they said. That person who was present at the trial and even offers to pay for Socrates' release, but is ill and not present at his death, is Plato. And Plato, as I've foreshadowed, is going to take Pythagoras and Socrates and put them together and advance, even more significantly, the axial revolution in ancient Greece. Thank you very much for your time. All right, guys. Um, so we're going to take a 10 minute break here and then uh, we're going to come back and do the discussion. So I think we've posted in Patreon, right, for anyone who wants first access to the co to the uh, discussion. So that's done. So um, those guys, if you're listening, if you're f um, from Patreon, um, jump in right now using the link that we gave you and I'll admit you to the discussion. And then uh, once we see if the, the chat group fills up. If it doesn't, then I will post the link um, prior to us actually starting the conversation. So uh, just stay tuned here, guys, uh, for 10 minutes. Go do your bathroom breaks or whatever, and we'll be back in uh, actually, I guess, 8 minutes, 40 seconds now. See you in a bit.
Hey everyone, um, so we're starting in two minutes, 45 seconds. Um, if you guys want to join the discussion, it's open now for everyone. Um, I think once we get to about 10 people, we'll probably shut it down. Um, but you're welcome to join at futurethinkers.org slash discuss. I've posted the link in the chat as well. So um, check back there. I will admit everyone into that discussion in two minutes. All right, how are you? I'm doing well. Are we still muted or are we? Hey, David. Not hey. Not Hello, how are you doing? Hey, guys. Good. How are you? Good. Doing well. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey. hey. All right. Are there a lot of people watching the show today? I think right now there's 26. I think it was around 30 at the high end, so not not too bad. A lot I mean, of people will watch after. Yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah. Yeah, not a lot of people are live. I, it's, I think it's kind of a weird time in the West, actually. Mm. All right, so 10 seconds. Everyone's ready. I'm going to switch over here. All right, so... I think we're good to go. Uh, chat, can you let me know if everything's good, if you can hear us all, and we can pretty much get started now. Again, if you want the link um, to join us in the conversation, it's futurethinkers.org slash discuss. Um, please no lurking, um, because you can actually do all the lurking from the YouTube channel, uh, the YouTube page itself where the video is playing. Uh, if you really want to discuss, then join us there. And yeah. I mm -hmm. think we're good. So, cool. Yeah, we're good. Got my wine. <laughs> that was a good one. So relevant. Yeah, yeah, very relevant uh, on bullshitting, self deception, and how uh, when we try to decouple, how was it phrased? Is the so what the sophists did. Uh, I'm just going to look at the notes now. Uh, truth and relevance, right? Yes, that's right. So when sophists try to decouple truth from relevance, all kinds of trouble ensued. And we see the same today with marketers, lawyers, uh, politicians, or other people who are saying things that sound salient that sound you know oh yeah that that's something but they're not actually true and the same happens in media as well mm -hmm. across the board it's everywhere yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, social media and digital technology in general uh what was it the the pornification of uh oh yeah confirmation porn that was a very good one, confirmation porn. So basically, a any idea that a person can have, any bias that can have, um, is easy to confirm and find 
something that justifies it if you just google in the right way or even if you're just participating in the echo chamber of the algorithm on social media and then for, uh, it seems like the same thing is happening in uh like in science as well uh, at least in how uh, scientific uh, research is reported on and how it's uh, broadcast uh, like to the to the broader audience yeah it's like we've forgotten that narratives are just narratives they're not actually the truth and people like if somebody speaks in a convincing way we think that that's true but it's not <laughs> narratives are just something that like helps helps us make sense of the world it's something that describes reality but they aren't reality so when we um and our bodies know this too i think a lot of the time when we hear something that kind of sounds plausible but we just feel all conflicted about it and you know our stomach is stirring and like oh something's really not right here but we don't listen to that we don't realize that that's a part of our sense making as well and a very important one so our body often knows when we're being bullshitted or bullshitting ourselves but because we we put so much emphasis on this rhetoric on this the way that words are strung together that we we forget you know i brought this up before a few times but that the discussion that jordan peter jordan peterson had um a while back um about his own personal narrator and at some point in his life he kind of separated himself from the narrator what there's a, people pending oh yeah okay thanks um he separated himself from the narrator and and you know, basically the narrator was saying, uh, when he started listening, it was saying, that's not true. Uh, you don't mean that, that's bullshit. And I thought, I thought that was very interesting because that actually happened to me as well. And it was like this, this very definitive point where, you know, I, my identity or my um, personality split into two. And um, yeah, I think that's a really important part about this uh, bullshit. Yeah, I had like a, a kind of different, uh, yeah, it's pretty relevant, but a, a, a quite a different uh, experience with bullshitting myself. It was uh, like, uh, even like uh, this uncertainty that you feel, uh, like, for example, lack of self confidence is also another form of bullshitting yourself. Normally, you're, uh, uh, as I understood from the lecture, uh, normally, um you just uh you are sure of some truths and that's how you bullshit yourself but another form is when you repeatedly say to yourself that you don't know things well and then um that uh, you don't know uh, enough about this or that and it's like a subtle form but it's also another form of bullshitting yourself because in a way then you're not taking responsibility uh, I, I believe that it's quite like it's a responsible act to stand by to stand behind some of your opinions, even if, if they are temporary, even if later on you change your opinions. But uh, it, 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 it does have a certain role to have like a certain attitude and to be certain of some things for at least some time in your in your life if that if that makes sense mm -hmm. like constantly uh, not not wanting to bullshit yourself is another form of <laughs> bullshitting yourself do you I mean, mean it's kind of like a second guessing or i'm not i'm not really second, sure i understand second, you. second uh, yeah is a second uh, or not wanting to form an opinion ah. because like you you know that uh, uh, the world is so complex everything that you uh, dive into uh, it just goes more into depth. I mean, you know that from anything that you dedicate your time to, and then it just like go, goes deeper and deeper, and then it kind of sounds out. like intellectual nihilism or something like that. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's yeah. a good yeah, yeah, yeah. Intellectual nihilism, uh, uh, 
but that's yeah that's another form of bullshitting yourself mm. or uh convincing yourself that you're not good enough not smart enough not capable enough and then seeking some sort of guru to tell you what's what mm-hmm. yeah yeah you, you can yeah you can uh, like resort to an authority from that uh, uh but not necessarily you can just like stay in this uh, that's that's funny because you know like this state of uh, intellectual nihilism it can be like a superior position you know and then you can look uh, from above to to anyone who holds an opinion mm-hmm. and you can like pretty much be in a position to question everything so uh yeah that's interesting. Uh, the form of bullshitting that i found in myself especially when I was younger, is, is kind of uh, to deal with that lack of self-confidence, to think that if I had that sense that something was off, that I had to be able to logically justify it or explain it in order for it to be valid. Mm. Um, now, just trying, there are lots of things that you feel and you sense, but you don't really understand, but um, allowing other people to override that sense in you because they say, well, because you can't explain it, then you don't know, then it isn't right. And that's one of the forms that I've noticed for myself. It's actually very similar for me. Uh, yeah, I was kind of trained to to an intellectualize everything yeah. um, growing up. And uh, when whenever I had intuitions or gut feeling about something like, you know, about a person being like manipulative or, or something like that, I wouldn't trust that feeling. And I would just rationalize it, and it landed me in, in hot water lots of times. And I had to learn the hard way that it's just like, no, that's it's valid. Like, your body knows. Your body's cognition is ancient. It's actually older than your rational verbal mind, and it knows. And so it's, it's not like either or. It's more about integrating them. You know, your rational mind knows something. Your body, your intuition, your physical cognition also knows something. And they're both very useful. Yeah, but I mean, I started to explain what Jordan Peterson thing was all about because I recognized this feeling in myself when I was starting to utter something that wasn't true before, out of a desire to appear, you know, smart to someone else or, you know, to be right. And, and this sort of like voice came up saying like, that's bullshit, that's bullshit. And then I started listening to that voice and, and doing, you know, trying my best to speak the truth. But you can get really confused, though, like if you don't know if you're not really in touch with that voice, I suppose, then you can think like any bodily reaction to a circumstance is the correct one. If they're, if you know, someone's like listening exactly to what you're saying, taking it literally. I mean, there's plenty of situations where the body doesn't know what the fuck it's talking about or, or doing, mm-hmm. and you should absolutely ignore it. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of examples of that in modern context. It's like we, we tend to go into panic mode for a lot of different reasons, but it's not like we're being chased by a zebra we just like don't exact or <laughs> by, by a zebra those pesky zebras <laughs> fucking zebras man um, no it's not like we're being chased by a lion or something it's actually like we're just stressed about the bank account being low this mm. week you know and the, the but the reaction is kind of similar i think it's about yeah. discernment like training those senses you know you have different capacities and and you can you can train them, you can refine them, you can learn to discern what's signal and what's noise for every capacity. Yeah, but you need a feedback mechanism. That's sort of the point I was trying to make. Like, mm. if you know, you need to be able to listen and then also test. And yeah. that's hard to know, you know. Which so get yourself a guru is what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 no, I'm joking. No. No. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm um, intrigued by this particular session, this, this lecture, because it's so, what he covers is so subtle, and to me wasn't clear how subtle it was. It dawned on me a little bit the first time that I watched it, it dawned on me a little bit more deeply this time and watching it, that, um, and, and I, I went back and reviewed uh episode three just before watching this I, I watched episode three again last night just because i was i felt like i missed some of the some of what was covered in that and the interesting part about knowing in the way that he says you know in the bible t- 
to know your spouse, to know your partner is sexually, and it, he means more participatory. The off is a participatory knowing, not an intellectual knowing. Not a, and so when he says know thyself, I like, it's like, oh, that has new relevance. That participatory knowing myself is the wisdom that Socrates has because he knows what he doesn't know. And what he, what he knows he doesn't know is the thing that the sophists trust, right? The, the thing that the illusory sense of certainty is the thing that he is aware, no, that's not the thing to note. It's actually, and it seems to me to be a real profound attunement between the body knowing and what the mind perceives and the dissonance and resonance between them. It's a very profound and deep way of, of interacting with both of those that Socrates could see was a challenge for most people and surprisingly seems to have been missed even in philosophical teachings largely. I mean, the, the, the common sense knowledge of what Socrates did misses that, right? <laughs> That's not the that's not the sense of what his teaching brought forth. Um, you know, the, the the sense of him being being just a pain in the ass for troubling people all the time was like this is a really hard thing to get. It's really hard to really see how much we're bullshitting ourselves all the time. Um, I really well, it like. Help. I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, it doesn't help that there's a, a lot of our culture is incentivizing people to continue bullshitting themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, from a very young age, people can get that twisted or mixed up and continue to rely on external sources to tell them what they're supposed to do yeah, or how those, they're supposed to interpret things. Those yeah. gravity wells have got a lot stronger for that kind of incentive to bullshit yourself. It's like we're in a marketing here's, here's, culture, you know? Yeah. Here's something though that I want to be really um, mindful about, because as I'm as I'm in this perspective, as I see my own life, there's something like this kind of awareness that has been subtly awake in me for most of my life. I'm aware of something that feels, you know, kind of like. Neo in the Matrix, some splinter in my mind of, wait a minute, there's something missing here. There's something, there's something bullshitty about preachers and ministers and marketers and parents and all of the school teachers. And it's like, what, what's wrong? There's something here. And using my mind to try to try to map out and understand it. And it wasn't until I was 50 years old. It's like, no, my body really does know something that that sense that I've had of Knowing something all this time is powerful. But I want to say, in this moment, as I'm waking up, the temptation is to say, those 50 years were wasted. I should have listened to my body back then. Or these last 2,000 years since Socrates have wasted, we should have listened to Socrates then. And it's like, the profound sense is, the universe really doesn't make mistakes, even in my delusion, right? There's something in the development of this there's something in the forgetting how to listen to my body that develops my mind that is a deeper sense of the partnership between my mind and my body that wasn't possible if i only if i only took socrates's perspective way back then or, or as a child there's something developmentally that 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 becomes becomes more deep and broad and the allowing myself to be as deluded as I was and then come back to awakening. There's something well, yeah. really um, interesting about this, the thought experiment that, that I've been playing with for, for a number of years now and I remind myself of it every time I get into kind of a, a negative mental loop and, it's, and I just basically ask myself the question, why would I have chosen this? I mean, if I were prior to incarnation, and it's just a thought experiment, I don't have to believe any of this, but why would I have chosen this situation? And like, that kind of gives me this reset about, and, and gives meaning to the thing that's happening. 
even if it's just bullshit. I can I can still feel that feeling of meaning and then gain sovereignty in that that situation. Going through that that period of development and and observing yourself and knowing that you um, are trying to reconcile these these feelings, these different types of knowledge, or these different types of knowing, it's. And, and thinking that you've wasted all this time, I see that a bit like thinking that you've wasted your childhood being a child because you didn't understand what was going on. I mean, that's an important part of development, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the distinction he makes with know thyself is not not like knowing your preferences or your your individual expression, but more about know the the owner's man, manual of being you, of being human. Know how your machinery operates. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were we kind of opened this discussion with like, well, how do you know? How do you listen to the body? And it's it's really just about this practice of listening and trying to figure it out and fucking it up and reviewing how <laughs> you messed it up and continuing to to work on that. But it's amazing, like how just that little bit of feedback loop of like testing, observing, iterating, fixing, you know, over time, learning your lessons, you know, cutting out repeated mistakes, like over time that compounds so much. And you can just look around at, at people who I suppose don't put in the same kind of work or not caring or paying attention to the same things. And it just problems become a lot more obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that point that he makes that the mental machinery that we use for realization and awakening is the exact same mental machinery we, we use for self-deception. It's basically, <laughs> uh, yeah, isn't it crazy? And, and it's a lot of it has to do with how we direct our attention. So what do we direct our attention to? And do we just let it be directed by other things? Or are we actually consciously putting attention on something over and over and over again? Be it like our bodily intuition, you know, our, our, our mental processes, our thoughts, you know, how we react to other people, what kind of narratives are going on, like all of those things. It's just like, where do we point the attention? The, um, the sense that the, there's a question that's been uh, that I've been exploring it, it's sort of a mantra I, I may have even mentioned it last week of uh, when do I get to be myself there's something that seems to be a kind of a question that's coming up more and more and the coincidence of the number of people who seem to be spontaneously like in this sense of stress and anxiety of oh my god I've been I've been doing something investing all of my time and effort in some belief that eventually it's going to return dividends to me and i think it's not going to and there's some kind of despair of i don't think that's ever going to return the dividends that i expected it to and so i'm so you know there's something of the frustration of oh my god i've been doing the wrong thing some initial thought of oh that's other people's fault for fooling me into believing that somehow Mm -hmm. And then there's some deeper realization it, that the despair in part comes to, if it took me this long to realize it, how long will it actually take me to wake up? There's something subtle like that thought that occurs to me. And then almost, you know, it, once that thought actually, once I can actually feel that that's kind of at the root of my despair, it sort of evaporates because it doesn't take any time at all to wake up. Isn't that because that is in that moment that is being awake? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, th- this idea that we're like someday going to be awake all the time forever without any more effort is, is I think, problematic. It yeah. sets us up for failure and disappointment. Yeah. But like in that moment well, of just suddenly being present, I mean, that's it. Job. Right. You know. I've seen a, a similar a- analogous uh, thing happen with people who um, – work a job they don't like until retirement saying that once they retire then they'll get to live the life that they want you know Mm -hmm. just just got to keep going towards that and i've seen so many people get to that point and then all they know how to do is what they've been practicing that whole time so it never really turns out like what they thought and it's very depressing for them 
Yeah, I was in a conversation with someone the other day who we were talking about goals and lifestyle, and he, I forget who it was, but he was saying how there's some goal that he has, financial goal, business goal, and he's not going to start doing other things that he likes, like learning how to program or <laughs> learning how to, you know, just various learning projects and then also playing video games and a few other things that he just wanted to have in his life. And he's like always setting this financial target so that he can finally relax. But I mean, the, the goalpost just keeps perpetually moving. And oh. so I shared with him like a, a big realization that happened for me in the last year, which is exactly that, like stop doing that, stop setting that goal and just make time and, you know, integrate the way you want to live your life into your current life instead of waiting for some financial or some condition. And yeah, I'm not as productive, but way, way happier. So. Well, it's a different type of perspective. You know, you're always putting a reason out there why you can't. There's always some other reason why you can't. And it's it's really just, you know, making the time to do it kind of reminds me of something my dad told me when I asked him, like, when did you know was the right time to have children? Right? He said, if you wait until you're ready to have them, you never will. Right? It's one of those things, like, if you wait until you're ready to live your life, then it'll be gone. Yeah. That's another reason we decided to make that decision. You, I don't know if, Yubi's, if you guys know Yubi's pregnant. <gasps> Congratulations. Uh -huh. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was really, like, it, the same thing I just said. It's like, well, you know, we're waiting for some perfect condition. It's, it's really <laughs> taking a while. So fuck it, you know, let's just, you know, let's adapt. Let's figure it out as we move. And, you know, I don't want to be like 70 with a 20 year old, you know. Uh, and then and then you have the opportunity to have your child or your children grow with you. Yeah. 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 I'd rather be able to, you know, be, be youthful with them. This actually really relates to the Socratic idea of marrying truth and meaning together, I think. What is the two things that he talked about? But it's, it's yeah, it's about how uh, things shouldn't just be salient. They also need to be meaningful. Like, it's not just, oh, yeah, this sounds about right. Like, the marketer is trying to tell you, no. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, theoretically it sounds right. But it actually has to be meaningful as well. Otherwise, things just get really twisted and perverted. And so, you know, what you're talking about with your friend who is just going after some sort of goal but not actually pursuing anything that's meaningful in his life, that's what happens when you decouple those things. Mm -hmm. It's happening so much, too. Like, all you know, it, it's weird that we've waited so long to have kids. And yet, in so many of our new group of friends, you know, the entrepreneurial type, we're like way, way early in having kids. Um, and most of them like are not, are not even in relationships and in like mid to late thirties, early forties, and just like not even bothering to try in that area. Um, just, uh, you know, everything is so much about Trello and <laughs> like when that next meeting or that next uh, goal is met. And um, you just see like everything's perpetually put off. Like we're on this treadmill. wheel, treadmill, yeah. So what do you guys think are um, some of the things that make people susceptible to bullshit? Not just by themselves, but from other people. Desire for meaning. I think the meaning crisis really is such a big thing. And it's funny because it's exactly like, you know, <laughs> cutting yourself off from your own internal felt meaning is what makes you seek meaning, which makes you more prone to bullshit. It's like it's that self-perpetuating thing. You know, I think people also too early jump onto conclusions uh, of, you know, life philosophies or lessons they think they've learned. And I mean, you know, we were watching you have this discussion with someone yesterday on Facebook. And um, I mean, that, that I think that's that conversation was kind of an interesting example of like someone who's like bought on to an ideology and is perpetuating that now has become a mouthpiece, have, hasn't really like investigated that thing deeply. Um, but then constantly flits from one lesson to another lesson and they're almost in polar opposites to each other. And like in rather than just sitting with it, that desire for meaning propels this desire to um, lock on to a conclusion and then spread that like it's gospel. 
And it's such a, I see this all the time. Like the, people can't seem to just like sit in not knowing. They yeah. need the answer. And therefore they like fall into these traps of believing other people's bullshit because they need that. Yeah, that's avoiding the un uh, unpleasant moments. Yeah. It's just like Ambiguity the... is unpleasant. Yes, yes, very, and it's bodily, uh, very uh, unpleasant. So yeah. uh, then you get like some information from your body which are like not uh, nice at all. It's not like comfortable, and uh, uh, that's one of the things that I believe drive this jumping uh, for the meaning, jumping for authority, jumping for something that feels certain and, and comfortable. Like mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a very natural drive, like very. It's very biological. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, people want certainty. Of... It makes them feel safer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like it's a very, very primal uh, need. But then on a practical level, I was just thinking before while you were uh, uh, um, discussing that, uh, like, in a way, you need to make this conscious decision to allocate a certain amount of energy every day to self-knowing uh, in what whatever like there are like many many different ways to to practice this uh and that uh but, but that's like and that's activity that, that's pretty much the only meaningful discipline <laughs> that you can have because then it like carries you through your days um yeah it's just like uh, it's something like um, allocating a certain time or energy each day for um, examining meaning <laughs> of your life every day, every moment, or uh, however you want to put it, like because uh, different people just uh, phrase it in, in different ways. Yeah, there was another actually uh, point uh, Jordan Hall posted uh, about kind of his approach to parenting. Uh, but the three things that he talked about, uh, I just found so relevant to in my own life in how uh, kind of in self-development and in self-actualization. And it was, um, let me try to find it. But one of them, one of them was that uh, attuning into your own sense of meaningfulness, what is meaningful. And a lot of the time, those things are not some grandiose narratives. It's not about saving the world or being the first at something or like, you know, a lot of these things that were sold. That's like, that's your meaning and purpose in life. You need to save the world or whatever. And, you know, who, <laughs> people who are lost often seek, you know, gurus or groups or whatever that try to sell that idea that, yeah, we're here saving the world. Join us. But actually, our sense of meaning a lot of the time is in very small mundane things like you know having a great heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your father that you haven't seen for a while or like coming out and noticing how the seasons are changing and the leaves are opening up or like maybe the leaves are dying and it's like oh wow nature is amazing like the these kinds of things that like they're small you know it's not some grandiose narrative but they're deeply meaningful if we just pay attention yeah, I also remembered what the Joe Brewer said in one of the previous episodes. I think what you're describing now, uh, uh, um, in a way, it looks like what he describes as finding what's sacred uh, to you. Yeah. Uh, like what's sacred actually is very close to what is meaningful for you. Uh, like for, for some, some people it's family, for some people it's uh, their art practice or, or whatever but uh, yeah the, the sense of meaning is also close to this say, sense of sacredness josh did you want to say something yeah on the topic of um like each of us sitting with uncertainty and not knowing while there is this sense of anxiety that can that you can feel sitting with uncertainty or not having an answer uh culturally and societally we're not very well architected to support people in times of uncertainty or accept people not having an answer. Um, like our, you know, the technology that we've built uh, doesn't deal with ambiguity or uncertainty very well. And I've found myself in periods of uncertainty in my life. Uh, it seems like everybody on the outside wants an answer. Well, what are you doing? What are you gonna do? 
And as hard as it is to sit with uncertainty by myself, I feel even more pressure when it comes to presenting that to the outside. Like I have to defend it. I don't have the language to defend it. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how do you justify or verbalize the felt truths that your body knows uh, in a world that just like doesn't really have a language or seem to have a, a respect or hold space for that anymore. That's very challenging. So there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like external momentum to well, come up with something. You got to have some kind of an answer, right? Uh, you know, it's a lot of pressure. It's so funny too, how society has changed and made us so much more individualistic. So we, we don't now get meaning from any kind of tribal context or like top down, you know, society, family, that kind of thing we're we're pushed into like we're, we're, we i think we've evolved to enjoy this type of meaning from a tribal context but we are now in a world that demands of us that we direct our own meaning and without that kind of more tribal context where a lot of us are floundering and i i've learned from entrepreneurship that like how important the ability to self-direct is, but how stressful and how much it sucks all the time. And, you know, how it would be just so much easier if I just had a job and had a paycheck. And it's the same thing with meaning. Like it, was, it would be so much easier if I just had that tribal context where I just had a group of people that are always around that, that I, I could have that meaning exchange with instead of needing like start a meetup and go to a conference and like, you know, do all these things that are, are so self-directed. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really feel there's more to the, the mindset of, of entrepreneurship and, and like jobbing, having a job that is so, f so grounded in our evolutionary biology that there's just so much more to it uh, about being self-directed versus having your tribe give meaning for you or give a purpose or direction for you. Well, that's kind of what I, I it's similar to what I experienced as far as the meaning being not only just individual, like what, what do I find important? Like what you were talking about, UV, with just being able to watch the the blossoms or the tree leaves changing colors like from that own personal level to just being present in the smaller moments but also extending into relationship with community you know how do i um how do i structure my life in a way that is the most beneficial to maximize my potential in a way that also maximizes the community around me and everyone that i interact with so uh, i think you're kind of a spot on there when you talk about how we've been brought to be so individualistic that we don't we don't have a whole lot of connection with what that meaning is relative to our community and we've also had a, a lot of community breakdown where in the past we might have had our family units on farms where we had a we knew how to interact with each other or we'd have local communities or uh, a lot of people went to churches and things like that and as those communities have broken down we find ourselves kind of in individual and scattered. So it's really awesome to be able to find communities like this where people all over the world are reaching out and finding that similar kind of community and learning how to interact in that new way again together. Yeah, so the idea of participatory knowing again, right? Like knowing as, as participation. So even when I'm saying like, I'm observing the leaves changing, it's like, Nature is changing, but I'm also nature. I'm also changing. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm participating yeah. in my observation of the leaves changing. It's not like yeah. a picture on the screen. And the same thing with my example of talking to my father. It's like it's a participation. You know, you don't have a heart to heart conversation with somebody without both participating. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's really something there. Like meaning is not just a thing that is external or just some internally felt thing. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, agent and arena it's an yeah. engagement of agent and arena like john verveke mm -hmm. says we have no template for deciding what is meaningful to us and then going out and and doing that thing it's like so much of the way we are is kind of wrote from cultural scripts or you know 
when we go out there on on our own and and try and do something on our own it's so much of it is informed i think speaking as a male a lot of it's formed like economically what would be the thing that nets me the most income and very little about it about it has ever been about family orientation and yet in do in making that a focus there's become there's suddenly become this opportunity where like i have more time now th that i can go i i can afford to go into that existential crisis of like what is my life now what is this meaning um so i'm thankful for that sort of material focus for a long period of time to then give me the time to do this and it's funny how many people in in these like entrepreneur communities that we've been a part of have like quote unquote made it and then gone immediately into an existential crisis immediately yeah <laughs> it's like yeah it's such a common pattern i i don't you know it's it's i think so it's interesting there's a there's an aspect of i think that that's clearly the mechanism i think that's one of the mechanisms of waking us up so i think that um this collective delusion this collective bullshitting of the path that we're taking of economic development has shifted us from community to individualistic but i think that the individualistic and uh, in order to make it in the world i have to make it alone i have to be a billionaire in order to ensure my survival is is like the drive but it's something this is a deeper thing that resonates in me that resonates in my culture it's a deeper form of bullshit it's a collective bullshit that has us move in that direction and at the point that you get there the people who actually do make it realize oh that doesn't actually solve the problem that i have i wake up and say now yeah it's it, i was saying i was noticing that there's some way that the belief that when i let go of my attachments i will sense freedom what I actually sense is, is I freak free out. Free fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, free exactly. fall. Yeah. It's like, oh, this, yeah, exactly. That free fall, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, uh, that that reminds me of the movie um, Jerry Maguire. You know, the song when he finally gets the insight is, I'm free, free falling. <laughs> and um, that is so true, but it's not ecstatic. <laughs> As, such an existential like oh my god what am i going to do now I'm learning the, to fly and got wings right <laughs> and the the sense of here's the thing that's really interesting to me is that what has been present up till that point is a bullshit version of a goal it seemed clear now that's gone i don't have any apparent goal or motivation directly i don't have anything that i'm attached to and yet i still have this motor that's driving saying but i should but i should but i should but i should keep doing something and in that moment what i found for myself was that that's an that's the opportunity to rest into the fall until i know what the need is don't follow the instinctual need to fulfill don't follow the strategic mind solving the problem until I know what the need is that I'm trying to fulfill and allowing that reorientation, that space of reorient reorientation to happen is very challenging. It's a, it's a, and it is the kind of thing that you learn and practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that where John Verveke is moving towards is participatory knowing, waking up participatory knowing through practice is a way to be with the discomfort of losing your, you know, of, of having the bullshit, the bullshit go goal evaporate upon waking up, right? When I wake up, then my goal will be clear. You wake up and you realize my goal was bullshit, right? It's like, oh, now what? Now, it's, it's such a subtle thing. And I think it's a very, I think that's one of the things that really hit me so deeply about this this lecture is John's perspective on you can't fool yourself into believing bullshit isn't the same thing as convincing yourself to believe 
Um, and waking up means having your bullshit kind of evaporate, explode, um, realizing, just recognizing it for what it is, is a, is a, um, it doesn't feel like from, from my previous self, I would not have guessed that's the direction to go in. You know yeah. that that point right. about falling, free falling. Um, there's a really uh, nice quote from Game of Thrones, uh, where Bran is falling from. Uh, he was pushed out of the window. I think it was in the f first uh, first couple of episodes of the first season, and he's uh, he's in a coma because he fell and you know broke his spine. Um, but he hasn't woken up yet. From his fall so he doesn't know that he's broken and uh he's in that liminal state and the three-eyed raven comes to him which the three-eyed raven is basically the the most powerful shaman in game of thrones and the three-eyed raven says you have a choice you are falling you are still falling but now you can choose to turn that fall into a flight and that is how you survive and so he does and he wakes up and yeah, he broke his spine, but he's alive. And so I think that's a really, uh, really interesting metaphor for what we're talking about here. Cause that fall can break, um, our notions, break our meaning structures, break our kind of sense of reality. But if we recognize that we can turn it into a flight, then some new life begins after that. I like this um, kind of monkey swinging in the jungle off of vines analogy. Like we're 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 each branch that we swing onto is some sort of meaning structure for us. Like dad, you know, school, job, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Like what happens if you just let go and free fall and stop grabbing onto any meaning structure whatsoever? Like even. Even the, the desire, even it, the meaning that is got, that is received from having a desire for meaning. Like, I, I know that's kind of strange mm -hmm. and recursive, but like meaning as a concept in itself, what if we let that go altogether as well? What happens? And it's something that, I don't know, books like Spiritual Enlightenment by Jed McKenna advocate exactly that thing. And... It's something like I can't help. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't like say to anyone, do that. Stop grabbing onto the next thing because you can't say that to anyone. Um, but I can't help but feel like that is a bit of a solution to a lot of the problems we're facing in the world. Like Stop grappling. Uh, <laughs> I would say that there's subtlety here. Yeah. Because when people hear that a lot of the people are like oh you're advocating nihilism and, and that's one of the biggest criticisms of jed mckenna is that he's advocating nihilism but i think that when that process goes far enough what happens is that well you can't help but realize that things are meaningful to you that's just part of the human machinery like we find things meaningful and to deny that would be to deny our nature and that's not helpful for anyone yeah, that's an excellent point. The nihilism, like, there's a subtle difference between what Jed McKenna is defining as enlightenment and what the nihilism experiences after you've done all that enlightenment work of deconstructing everything. There's a very subtle difference, and I think you illustrated it there quite well, which is like to stop denying things that are inherently meaningful, being a, a parent or being, you know, any of these ideas. Like, you're not grasping onto it, you're just letting it be meaningful. Yeah. And this is actually something that um, David Chapman talks about on his website, Meaningness. Like that's that's just what's, what his whole website, which is kind of a, a book that he's writing in website form, that, that's what it's all about, is recon reconciling between meaningfulness and meaninglessness. And so he talks about uh, this kind of, you could say, traditional form of meaning making, which relies on meaning being externally handed down kind of solid you know eternal like this means this and it means this forever and when that breaks people start falling 
and then they fall often into nihilism which is like okay so that's all bullshit so nothing is actually meaningful and then but then that's also rigid it's like nothing yeah. is meaningful nothing can be meaningful and that's what i meant by the denial of what is inherently meaningful yeah. without effort like that that's a effortful thing to deny the meaning yeah exactly and then what can end up ha happening is that people develop these very fancy mental structures to justify why things can't have meaning and they have even like nihilism as a philosophy to live by as if that's even possible um but this this is just like the the flip side it's just as wrong as uh you know fixed meaning and so to reconcile the two is, is what i was saying before it's just to to recognize that no things things are not fixed and in meaning is it's changing and it's different for people and it's like the felt experience of meaning is different for people and yet there are some things that just are inherently meaningful because of because we're human because that's how like that that's it's part of our survival mechanism is that some things are meaningful and more meaningful than others it, it i think there's also like, oh sorry go ahead Naveen. yeah um, it sounds like um, like the, the picture that I get in my head is like a bridge and then you have like two posts uh, of the bridge and the post would be some sort of meaning uh, or some sort of uh, falls like entrepreneurship versus jobbing. And then you have like the bridge that you're walking on. And uh, it seems like it's worth uh, putting your energy and attention right into the tension between the two like into the tension between meaningful and mean, uh, mean, meaningfulness and meaninglessness. Is that, is that the word? <laughs> um, <laughs> my English skills, yeah. Uh, and, and then like this tension would be like uh, uh, related to the, to, the, to, the, to the fall, to the free fall uh, metaphor. Mm. I mean, that's mm. how I like, just see it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this sounds a lot like uh, in John's newer episodes where he talks about playing with how much signal you let in and how much noise you let into your, your awareness because it's almost like if you, there's sometimes when you, you have to look for that meaning otherwise you're going to fall into nihilism so you have to let in a signal you normally wouldn't let in but in some cases you don't want to let in too much signal because then you let in noise and then it can it can kind of lead you into trouble so i don't know if if that if that makes sense in in this case of what we're, we're discussing but but it, it's hard to find that balance and i think part of exploring meaning and uh, and these topics can help you calibrate in the right situations you know he brought up happiness in in okay well, what is happiness and well if you were you know and he kind of deconstructs that like going down this train of of thought that has to occur to really understand what happiness happiness is and then how to define that goal so i mean what is your goal in this situation um for some people, you know, that the whole Jed McKenna series, I love those books. And for me, that's been like such a, uh, an important thing to be able to articulate is what, what he's discussed in those books. And, and his philosophy is like rip the bandaid off. But, but people who read that book or those sets of books and have that goal alignment with those sets of books are not looking for happiness at all. That's not what that's about. In fact, that's, antithetical to happiness that's not going to be your experience if you go through the, that process um but i mean i you know I, I i love the work that has been presented from that book and it's all about ripping the band-aid off and stop you know letting in any signal to use your analogy for meaning cut it all off but again that's not something you could ever advocate it's like you could live a very happy fulfilled productive everything life and go nowhere near that work. So we're talking about like waking up, but are we also talking about happiness? Or are we talking about productivity? Or you know, what are the things that each of us is kind of optimizing for? But I, I feel like there's this global sense that there's a bit of an awakening occurring, and and yeah, I mean, my thinking is maybe a little bit more of that band-aid ripping off 
strategy might be productive. But I, I see what you're saying about let in a bit of signals. But to me, it's just like it, it, it almost does the function of pulling you away from the waking up, you know, or just, just pacifying you in that process. Yes and no. Yeah. So. <laughs> I knew you, were be, you and I never agree on this. <laughs> um, so it's that idea that you're never done, I think, actually, is one of the biggest things that I disagree with Jed McKenna on. So he thinks that at some point you're enlightened and you're done. I completely disagree with that. I think it's a process. And, and it's like you're just refining your, your machinery and you can, you can be more awake each moment and you can, like, you know, p pay attention better and and have more discernment but it's not like you're never done because as soon as you think you're done you've stopped <laughs> paying attention and you're asleep yeah. so uh it's it's that thing like as soon as you think you're wise you're no longer wise yeah. but so, if you're enlightened and then you're done what do you do next <laughs> die or sit on a bench yeah. <laughs> but the, those are your options the environment's the, the environment never stabilizes, right? So it, it, as long as the environment proposes some sort of challenge, then we're going to be, we're going to have to to calibrate the, I guess, the amount of signal or, or noise you, you let in. And, and in these times, especially, it's like now is the time to, like John also says, like break frame, I guess, a little bit, you know, again, depends on the person and on is it on a cultural level or on an individual level but but you know that, that's like you said it's it's our adaptive machinery that we have to use in the right place at the right time and it's just knowing when and how much but now seems like a time for everyone to to break the frame a bit and and get together and, and think about these things mm -hmm. But actually, that was a good point that you made about the it's never done because it's it's like. I mean, I, I think there is like a, a, a mountain of work that you do to just be in that state more, but also to now support your point, the the kind of letting go of the branch and like having a little bit more hang time between meaning structures. Uh, I think that's that's more in line with what I feel like is is maybe necessary like we don't we don't need to like forever dump all meaning we we just might need to like get a little bit more air time break frame. between yeah, yeah exactly break, yeah. Fr break frame That's yeah so this is what i was trying to say is like what jen mckinnon is talking about it's a process so letting go of the branch letting go of meaning is a process and being in free fall it's like you can observe how meaning is actually constructed in your mind and if you try to grab onto another branch immediately, you've stopped the process. So it is important to let that process hang for a while or, mm -hmm. you know, not hang because you're not hanging from a branch, but the fall yeah. for yeah. a while. Air, hang time. <laughs> so what happens when you make that process your meaning? Well, then that's another like that. Actually, that is exactly the lesson, I think, that is illustrated in, in if you meet the Buddha along the road, kill him. Like, I love that one. That's my favorite thing because it's like one of those last steps. One. <laughs> it, it, because it's like if you are working with a guru, like he becomes your center of meaning. And he's like, if he's doing his job, he's whacking away all of your your pillars of meaning. But then you still are, are kind of separating mm -hmm. him from the rest of the world. Like you still in your mind have the guru is the meaning, the giver of meaning or the destroyer of meaning. And that's part of the job that he's got to finally do at the end of the whole thing is cut, is kill himself in your eyes, like take himself out of the equation. You don't have meaning anymore from this guru. He's just another dude that is full of shit. And you don't you know, you can't tell if he knows what he's talking about. So that uh, that saying is really about that. Like, that's one of the last steps. If you meet the Buddha along the road, kill him. Well, the way huh. that um, the way that Ken Wilbur describes it, actually, in the interview that we haven't released yet, but we filmed uh, last week is that basically if you think you've figured it out that's not it yeah yeah it's like if whatever kind of yeah it's, it's similar it's whatever kind of meaning structure or like oh i've got it like gemstone thing that you yeah. uh so do you guys know the gemstone reference become i think most of us have discussed this before like okay. you have some sort of insight and you're like oh that's it i figured it out and i'm gonna 
like yeah. make my whole life about this and i'm gonna go tell everybody about it and like which is like what happens the first time people do ayahuasca or take acid or like go on a meditation retreat suddenly that's the gospel they've got to tell that to everyone i am jesus incarnate suddenly from my first ayahuasca experience <laughs> and like yeah Congratulations, so are we. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Welcome. Okay, shut up now. <laughs> okay, Jesus. <laughs> Go back in your cave, keep meditating. Yeah, I, I read about um, a very, like, a concept that was uh, quite interesting to me, and uh, it says, like, death from exhaustion. So... Um, Go on. Uh, it, it comes from uh, uh, Toltec tradition i read it in a in a book about um, some uh, toltec practices and uh related to what you were just talking about uh to keep your meaning structures it requires endlessly more energy than it takes to consistently nurture your uh, uh frame breaking which inevitably mm. ha like if you are if you are um nurturing uh the the the, the practice of self-knowing in any form uh over like uh, um, uh, sometimes in your life uh, those big transitions will happen and they release actually what they do is that they really release uh, enormous in energy even though it seems like they're draining you and uh, because of this unpleasant feeling that you have from this free fall you have the impression that it's taking like all of your uh, that it sucks your uh, life energy out of you while it actually just does the opposite it just resets you while if you're sticking to whatever framework or whatever meaning in life that you impose on yourself you're just going to like feed it with energy endlessly 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 and then you actually die from exhaustion whatever happens at your old mm -hmm. age or whichever age like whenever that happens um there's a physical cause of your death, but there is also this energetic cause of your death, and that is like complete exhaustion with your meaning structures. It's like an um, operating system upgrade, um, you know, in, in yeah. to take that metaphor really literally, like the CPU is actually running hot, and it's writing a lot to the hard drives during that process. And then once all of that's finished, you're done, and the processor slows down, there's no more writing to the drive. But that whole restart process of upgrading is, is very labor intensive. Did everyone get this, the uh, gemstone metaphor? Just, I feel like we jumped from that. Mm -hmm. Did you understand that? Yes. It's like picking up meaning structures that re are represented as gemstones along a path. And it's like, you, you know, I, I've suddenly got this new like idea or meaning structure. That's a gemstone. I pick it up, examine it, love it, put it in my pocket, keep it with me. Then maybe start a business selling that yeah. kind of gemstone yeah, to other exactly. people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I make an ebook, three-step process to examining your gemstone, and then, yeah. Uh, I love this part from the lecture that we just listened about uh, the, the Delphi uh, in, in Greece and the, how the whole, like, Oracle business was operating is like with Titia that uh, the, the the oracle had to come up with this uncertain and like completely ambiguous answers because it keeps you coming for more. So there was like this business uh, uh, business business uh, activity going on as well, like besides the the kind of like spiritual meaning making or whatever, like. Well, that it's as old as humanity. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same in modern cults or gurus, like, or even self-help gurus or, or politicians. It's always like something that like, oh, you're not good enough, like, and, and give you some sort of vague direction, like, oh, you need to aim towards this thing. And like, I, I have the answer, but you don't really get it. Like, oh, you're just... It's spiritual gatekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's a uh, one of the things that I suspect makes us most vulnerable to bullshit is our need to constantly search for answers outside of ourselves in that way. Yeah. If we keep deferring that knowledge to somebody else, then there's going to be people who step on step up and say that they have it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So uh, I think the most resilient that we can make ourselves is to learn how to know ourselves in that way, like what you were talking about earlier, David, and and, and know ourselves more fully and to be able to sit with that uncomfortable not knowing and uh, get a real sense of what need we're trying to 
uh, fulfill before just running and grabbing and saying, oh, do you have the answer? Do you have the answer? Do you have the answer? Because people will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's on the... Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's almost like you, you have to try to follow your own salience landscape first and be willing to make mistakes instead of deferring to other people or gurus because if, it's like what they tell entrepreneurs to or business people to succeed you have to do it yourself and don't be afraid to fail in the same way i, I guess with development it's like follow your own salience landscape or whatever you feel inside in your 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 body and your, your system and then learn from it and reflect on it after and then grow and then you really know for sure mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, it's like, uh, how, how much trouble can you get into if you do that? So, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to say for sure, but Lots. that's what I feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. Lots you of get, trouble. You get a lot more trouble if you, if you just rely on someone else to tell you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's just different kinds of trouble. Yeah. There's yeah. going to be trouble either way, you know? Yeah. 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 And actually, I think it's the, this is, again, the interesting, um, last week's call we were talking about, the alternate way to view cyclical time is the sine wave. There's something sine wave-ish about this, uh, again, relating to last week's call and this week's call, the bullshit cycle of kind of going around and around and around this loop relates to me metaphorically to the continuous world view of the power being in that. But it, it's, Nev, you were talking about the energy builds up and that gets to a point of escape velocity, the bullshit, you know, kind of, it's a, it's a cyclotron of a kind. It builds up and builds up and builds up until it can't hold the container anymore. And now I shoot off into a kind of a linear mode, transition to someplace new. And then when I can't continue that, I land and do, do another bullshit cycle. So these cycles of, of cyclical and then linear yeah. Motion. Oh, that kind of that, uh, brings to mind the continuous universe and then the separate universe, and like he was talking about switching between those two. Yeah. And that maps also onto what what uh, uh, Jordan Greenhall says about you know the blue church. It was it, it was kind of like we we deferred for so long to a relatively stable uh, imposition of culture on us for you know since World War II or whenever it was, and now that like you said, it is reaching escape velocity now. And it, that's no longer, I guess, the, the healthy or the, the acceptable way forward. And so now everyone's, you know, looking to themselves or smaller groups or, or communities for, for new, new knowledge, new culture and practices to, you know, break, break that frame. And now we, we're at that part of the cycle now. And then who knows what it will maybe repeat again. I love right, the so, so I, that, I love the bullshit cycle thing. Yeah, it's, it's like a great. You meet somebody and then you ask, "Oh, which bullshit cycle are we?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a cool. Well, it's interesting. System. It's interesting too because now you know the the looking at that and kind of backing up. Um, this prolonged bullshit cycle of authority is external. The ability to abstract a parent as God as, oh, I have to follow the rule, and the rule is out there, and I don't know, and I need to, I need to get to the point of getting approval from the authority is, a, is, is an attractive force which builds up a super intense collective bullshit cycle of us running around this, and the meaning crisis is the wobbliness of this bullshit cycle losing coherence. Mm. It's we're fragmenting into a thousand billion <laughs> pieces flying off the flywheel. Um, but I don't, you know, it's and it's fascinating from that perspective. There's a sense of wonder. We've never, I mean, imagine, imagine a billion Socrates. Yeah. <laughs> imagine the ax axial revolution as the next Buddha is a Sangha. The next Buddha is the planet saying, oh. That was all bullshit. Here we are, yeah. awakening to this moment, yeah. free falling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a whole this kind of new definition of self-governance, too. Mm -hmm. 
it's amazing how we we don't pay more attention to the discoveries we make as individuals that that all of the rest of society is either made i mean brilliant great thinkers in the past have made before and we just kind of many of us come to these conclusions on our own just through experimentation but don't don't realize the brilliance of that um that kind of self-discovery and the fact that we're all doing that at the same time like it, it's it's like we only value what is what is new and documented the most new as far as new ideas you know actually and i sense? think that the yeah it does and actually i think that the the um the thing that this this kind of encapsulates the benefit that I see of the Meaning Crisis Lecture series for all is it the part of the awakening is how full my pockets are of gemstones of things that I thought that were wonderful. And it's like, OK, let me unburden myself. I don't need any of those gemstones. It's the it's the process of knowing myself participatorily in this moment. I am, that's the, that, that's the abundance, not all of the gemstones that I've collected. You know, it's the same thing. And as I have like, to be careful to make sure that's not a gemstone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now go forth and <laughs> preach to the world your new gemstone. <laughs> I like the idea. Uh, and another analogy is like, you know, we're all kind of floating down a river. Some of us are floating. Some of us are thrashing and drowning, but you know, just, not realizing how to just relax and float and take a deep breath and become buoyant. I, I, I love that. I, I think about that quite often. This this idea that it doesn't all have to be a struggle. You can just let go and, and float. I don't know if I'm describing that very well. but <laughs> It also depends on where you think about you being because it's, you know, the conscious rational narrator mind likes to grasp onto things and it likes to think that it's in control and it's that part that lets go and but then there's there's a bigger you that's still doing something that's in tune with all of nature you know your unconscious mind your body like if you think about <laughs> I love thinking about it as, uh, this way so if we think about it in terms of the big bang and of course, I realize that that's like the current scientific story that we use to describe the formation of the universe. It could be something different, but that's that's the one. So let's go with that metaphor. So if you think from the beginning of the Big Bang, you know, it's like it's a bunch of feedback loops that have built on each other and have become more and more complex from atoms to molecules to, uh, you know, celestial bodies, different kinds of stars, planets, you know, spiral galaxies, and then spiral galaxies develop planets that could sustain life, and then simple organisms, and more complex organisms, and then blah, 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 and then us, like, there, there's, it's a continuous process that's still happening, so you, like, at, at the greater, greatest level you can imagine is that, is all of that, like, that's still continuing, you know, so when you say like let go and float down the river it's just like the, the relaxing into that greater you mm. you know yeah i feel like the river analogy is actually better than the monkey swinging analogy because mm. it it implies this drowning thing that a lot of us feel like we're doing mm. which is which is better because just stop thrashing and float you know just yeah because free fall implies like this death. hitting death, exactly, yeah. hitting the ground, which actually is relevant to the Jed McKenna stuff. But, mm -hmm. but I don't know. The experience is, is definitely more of like a, a drowning and then coughing up a lot of water and then floating. <laughs> yeah, I almost think of it as like you, when you talk about you know, being like water and letting go of certain things out of your control, like the, the, the stoicism and... And, and, and those things too. And now it's it's kind of like we're in a place where the 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 flow or the the logos kind of involves all of society and culture in a bigger way, being okay with breaking their frame. And you know, it can seem like a free fall for for a lot of people. But also to what you're saying before, if you hang on to those structures you've hung on for so long in a changing environment. 
there's just going to be more friction in your processor and you're going to overheat, you're going to overload. And now's the time to, to, you know, just go with the flow and with the logos and however you want to say it and, and, you know, break your fame a little bit. It's made me think of that. It's funny how ne necessary it is to have so many different metaphors, you know? Like I find like computer processor metaphors work a lot more for geeks. Like mm -hmm. I just see light bulbs go on. <laughs> and then you talk about like leaves and trees nature. and nature. nature and metaphors. That, just works. that always works with other types. <laughs> but yeah, we need so many different stories and metaphors for this to all make sense. So I'm glad we're all doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really valuable that John Verbeke's doing it, just giving giving us language to talk about things like I, I could never talk about before. It's, it's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's what I find too. That's my experience is that these are things that I kind of inherently understand and know intuitively, but I don't have a language to speak about them with anybody. So yeah. being able to, to find words that, you know, have a common well, understanding. It's very nice. Yeah, it's funny how the words have this effect of solid, both solidifying the experience and then transmitting the experience to others. It, it makes it makes a participatory knowing out of a, something that's normally just a perspective perspectile knowing i guess if that's the right way to to say it you you really feel it in a in a different way we're uh we're at over an hour um i think probably is the time to wrap up but let's just give anyone else a chance who hasn't spoken so much if you've got anything to say anything burning then let's dive into that but wrap up and say five minutes anyone else nothing right. burning chat chat <laughs> <laughs> no it's a pleasure to speak to you guys again it's Likewise. really nice yeah yep. really so i i do actually have one question i know last time we were kind of starting to touch on um, scaling this to larger because there are so many people it seems to want to be involved in this um, have you guys thought any much more about that or um, well I mean there's is it kind at, of letting me off at the moment there's not exactly a necessity for it yet like all okay. of chat is still watching which is not that many people it's only 20 people and then this is all the people we could get for the, the video Okay. So I think there's not really a necessity for it yet, but we'll think about it as like each week progresses and more people get involved. I know that there are certain human limits, just like Dunbar number limits to uh, productive discussion. And I would say that 15 is the absolute uppermost limit, but eight seems to be pretty optimal. Like yeah. if it's under eight, then it's really good, but then it can stretch to 15 or so. But then if it's over 15, then it gets chaotic and it just yeah. uh, it breaks co coherence. Like so. we could keep the mode going the way it is now where we don't have to like raise hands. People can just, you know, oh, you first, that kind of thing. And everyone's polite. Um, but after like eight that we start needing a system by 15, it breaks down completely. So probably we could just set a threshold when it gets to a certain number. Then we will have to figure something split out it in half or something and do two separate groups. Mm -hmm. um, we also do a lot of other calls, too. So I don't know. There's other opportunities to have these types of discussions throughout mm -hmm. the week. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of weekly calls, so that's an option. Um, but as far as the Verbeke with us if stuff, you want to participate in other things. <laughs> yeah. The, as far as the Verbeke stuff goes, I mean, what we could do is like elect someone to be sort of the moderator role of which is what we're doing, but it's not really, you know, we're just participating, but you know, you can just have the moderator yeah. tools and then um, yeah, split off if we need to. But yeah, we're not, I don't think we're at the necessity yet. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any so other questions? It's hard questions? to say, because sometimes, sometimes you just get waves and uh, waves of interest, and all of a yes. sudden you might have a whole bunch of people. And I'm just kind of curious. Well, what I'll do is have a separate uh, link ready for, for group two. So okay. if we need group two, I'll just have that ready on hand. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. All right, guys, see you next week. Thanks, uh, new people, for joining. Uh, yeah, uh, so next week it's uh, on Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. UK time, and that's the watch party. And then an hour later, so 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. UK time is the discussion.
and uh, the the link for the exact YouTube video will be on our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash future thinkers, I believe. Yep. Comment, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell icon. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. See you next week. Okay, bye. Right. Thanks. All right, take care. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.